In this webinar, we look into what does 2023 hold for Africa from a business perspective? In Africa, we begin a new year with the spec. In this webinar, we look into what does 2023 hold for Africa from a business perspective? In Africa, we begin a new year with the spectra of rising inflation, political uncertainty, and volatile markets. We ask our invited experts to comment on the key issues facing businesses in Africa amidst rapidly evolving social, political, and economic circumstances. Our hosts, Professor Rajneesh Narula and the Dean and Director of Henley Business School Africa, John Foster Pedling, will be joined by our three panelists. Dunning Africa Center. It's not a place, it's a continent-wide conversation. Join us on the first Thursday of every month. In this webinar, we look into what does 2023 hold for Africa from a business perspective? In Africa, we begin a new year with the spectra of rising inflation, political uncertainty, and volatile markets. We ask our invited experts to comment on the key issues facing businesses in Africa amidst rapidly evolving social, political, and economic circumstances. Our hosts, Professor Rajneesh Narula and the Dean and Director of Henley Business School Africa, John Foster Pedling, will be joined by our three panelists. Dunning Africa Center. It's not a place, it's a continent-wide conversation. Join us on the first Thursday of every month. In this webinar, we look into what does 2023 hold for Africa from a business perspective? In Africa, we begin a new year with the spectra of rising inflation, political uncertainty, and volatile markets. We ask our invited experts to comment on the key issues facing businesses in Africa amidst rapidly evolving social, political, and economic circumstances. Our hosts, Professor Rajneesh Narula and the Dean and Director of Henley Business School Africa, John Foster Pedling, will be joined by our three panelists. Dunning Africa Center. It's not a place, it's a continent-wide conversation. Join us on the first Thursday of every month. Welcome to the Ninth or the tenth or Dunning Africa Center webinar uh, webinars we've been running now for a year. Uh, wonderful to have a large audience back again in the new year. Very exciting for me as well because uh, uh, I think that so much is happening in the business world right now. We're full of uh, intrigues and new developments, and some people have lots of hopes, and some people have great fears about 2023. And that indeed is the theme of, of this, this month's uh, webinar. As you know, this is a monthly conversation. Uh, we do this uh, the first Thursday of every month. And the idea is to make people think about things from different angles and to have a kind of a comfortable, relaxed and casual discussion about uh, matters that, uh, uh, that impinge upon business life, the economic life of the continent. Now, I have the good fortune, as always, of having some great speakers to 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 join me in the in the session. I'm sorry that uh, my uh, colleague John Foster Pedley, who normally is here, uh, is away traveling for good purposes um, to save the planet, I suspect. Uh, but I I won't speak for him this matter. And uh, but I have with me uh, two wonderful uh, guests. Uh, we have uh, first. Uh, Eleanor Williams. Uh, I'm going to let Eleanor introduce herself because CV is so impressive that I'm not sure if I miss anything out, uh, I will never hear the end of it. So Eleanor, the mic is yours. Thank you. And, and thank you for inviting me to join you this evening. Um, so I'm Eleanor Williams. I'm a global trade expert. I currently work in the Connected Places Catapult in the UK, which is a research technology company that is tasked with accelerating innovation in kind of place leadership and transportation. And I do quite a bit of that around the world. But prior to joining the Catapult last year, I spent 20 years working for the British government, 
largely in international trade. Um, in uh, I spent a, a bit of time as the UK's trade director for South and Southern Africa. Um, I spent a little bit of time as the director for financial and professional services in international trade. So I spent quite a lot of time traveling the world um, pursuing bilateral trade interests for the UK. Um, but thank you for welcoming me to the webinar this evening. The pleasure is mine. I think we're going to hear more about bilateral trade agreements later on. And now that she's no longer an um, employee of His Majesty's government, uh, she can be more forthright and honest uh, with us. Uh, we have uh, a repeat visitor in the form of, uh, of MD Ramesh. Uh, Ramesh, uh, again, I'm going to, again, if I paraphrase, uh, I always forget something. So I, I, again, the floor is yours to briefly introduce yourself. Thank you, Rajesh, and uh, thank you all for having me this evening. Um, my name is Ramesh, and uh, I am a specialist in experience out of Africa in the food and agri sector. I've spent 30 years uh, on the continent doing that, um, 15 years in South and East Africa, 15 years in West Africa. So I do believe a little bit of uh, Pan-African experience. Uh, I am now residing in Lagos and I manage a food processing business uh, in West Africa. And uh, that's when I ran into Raj and here we are. Pleasure. We, we would have had the, the, the benefit of uh, the opinion of uh, Evan Jackson, who is CEO of Marsh uh, West Africa. Uh, I understand that it's a busy time for, for Evan. Um, I think this is the month that the insurance industry gives out bonuses. So she has to be in the office, I think, more than normal. Uh, but there may be other reasons. Uh, you know, it can't, it can't all be financial. Uh, although it's a financial industry, by definition, uh, that is often the case. So I think our, our theme today, uh, you know, uh, I mean, we, it follows on our pre on previous month's uh, discussion. What are we going to have? Is Africa going to fa face a recession or a slowdown? And uh, Ramesh was here for that uh, session. And uh, the general opinion at the time, this was in November, I think, that uh, we're looking at a slowdown rather than a recession across Africa. Um, and I think this is a kind of a good place to, when we're looking forward, and one of, one of the things that I learned many, many years ago uh, was that uh, I met this guy who said to me, uh, we were talking about forecasting, and he said, do you know the first rule of forecasting? I said, no. So the first rule of forecast is never forecast. And I said, wow, that's really a heavy rule. He said, you know, the second rule of forecasting, I said, uh, uh, no. He says, the second rule of forecasting is if you must forecast, never forecast the future, uh, which I thought was also uh, quite a useful rule to follow. And he said, do you have a third rule of forecasting? Um, and, he, and I said, no. He says, uh, try and forecast as close to the present as you possibly can. Because <laughs> um, uh, it's a linear progression from whatever you've got at this current point in time. Um, and I, I think uh, all three rules I'm going to ignore. Um, but uh, so, but one of the things about talking about this in November is that it doesn't seem to me that, uh, you know, when we look back, because we want to understand what's going to happen in the future, the best reference point we really have is the past. Um, and, you know, what happened in 2023 is a function to a great extent of what happened in 2022, and then by extension also what happened in the years uh, before that. Well, path dependency is one of the most powerful forces on the planet. So let's start with this uh, question is, first of all, you know, the recession. Uh, Ramesh, you, uh, um, you, you, we all agreed on in November that this was not a recession, this was a, a, a slowdown. Uh, are you still of that opinion? Oh, yes, very much so. And um, as I said then, I still say it, that uh, there is no one Pan-African uh, rule that all countries will follow. Uh, they all have different reasons for behaving differently. But largely, I don't see a recession. I see a slowdown. Uh, and, and we have discussed all the reasons for that uh, the last time out. But let's, I think we, it's useful to re return to, to that theme. And, and uh, I mean, with the baggage of 2022, it weighs heavily upon us. And one of the, the, the large items of baggage that everyone tends to explain everything nowadays, even in the UK, 
we people talk about well, you say what's happening what's wrong with the british economy and everyone says well it's a pandemic um and you know it's not brexit it's a pandemic uh, so whatever goes wrong has nothing to do with brexit so in this case it's you know what let, let me turn to ellen now what what do you think is the been the effect of uh, of of the uh, pandemic do you think this is something we should be looking in africa as a kind of are we looking at the and the, the the lingering effects of the pandemic. I what do you think? What's your thoughts on this? I think there are marginal lingering effects of the pandemic. I think it would be unfair to say that there aren't any of those, but I don't think it's as severe as in Europe, as in North America. I think we've got perennial issues on the continent that are lingering almost in, in a cyclical way. Um, and I think we're just going through that cycle now, but I don't think the pandemic is, I don't think we can kind of point to the pandemic as the cause or the reason for, for some of the challenges on the continent at the moment. And I don't think they have been exacerbated to the same extent as they have been elsewhere. Uh, Ramesh, you wanna jump in on that? Yes, I, I agree with uh, Irina on this, and this is consistent with what we said in November as well, that the impact of the COVID is not so much. However, small and medium enterprises that went through an extended period of poor business or no business uh, are paying the price for COVID even now because business hasn't quite caught up or their capacity to hang around for that long a period uh, does not exist. So those deep pockets which are not with the SMEs have resulted in a lot of them closing down, which has resulted in unemployment. Yeah. The other thing that I think the COVID has impacted uh, Africa in general is the fact that uh, the stamina of governments to subsidize populations and the pop a lot of the population struggled from uh, employment challenges during the COVID period. So there is, there is definitely a carry forward of all of that, which is still hanging over the economies over here. Mm -hmm. Having said that 23, uh, is projected to be good for many African countries. Some 8%, 7%, 6% kind of growth rates being projected. So I'm hoping that uh, employment will pick up again. <coughs> so At which you... stage we'll be able to say that COVID is not impacting us anymore. So uh, let me come back to, you mentioned the SMEs thing. Uh, and it is, and I, I have to say that one of the things everyone notices or says that, you know, there has been less visible effects in terms of deaths, at least across Africa. Although you know, some dispute it and argue that since there's very poor uh, public health, you know, we don't actually know. But nonetheless, the evidence is not as strong uh, uh, about, about that as well. And it is true that, so I read somewhere the World Bank estimates that 100 million people entered poverty across Africa as a result of the pandemic. Uh, and I suspect that uh, given that, you know, in places like Nigeria and Ghana and most of West Africa, it's 18, 90 percent is in the informal sector. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this is even smaller than SME. Uh, so there has been an increased, increased level of people below the poverty line. Uh, I don't haven't seen any recent statistics. I don't know if any of you have. But um so we certainly see more people at the bottom end of the economy. Um, but I think, what, I don't know if this is, if it's, uh, you say big farms are able to buffer buffer better. You say, this is what you're suggesting. Um, the big farms have survived unscathed. Uh, so Raj, I am quite confident that across Africa, the big firms, and you know, in most of these African countries, there are very few big firms, a handful, mm -hmm. 10, 15, 20, depending on the size of the country. They have remained resilient through the uh, COVID. Many of them for reputational reasons haven't uh, discharged any of their employees, unlike the Metas and the Googles. All right. Uh, my group, for example, employs over 10,000 people. And it was clearly stated by the stakeholders that we won't get rid of even one of them. We did business during the uh, COVID time, and it's been a very, very good phase of business for us. And I'm aware of across Africa, that has been a very sim similar principle uh, that most large firms have managed to hang on to their employees during this period. Uh, Elena. So I was just thinking about the fact that 
during COVID, during the pandemic, one of the areas of, of growth for the continent was the business process outsourcing sector. Um, uh, and I think, you know, quite a lot of international firms from across the world, you know, brought those services onto the continent during the pandemic, which I guess helped to act as a little bit of a buffer um, in some places, I guess, uh, balancing some of the losses from, from other areas of employment. And I think we will see that continue to flourish um, uh, as those economies, you know, do their best to to create employment opportunities for to, yeah to tackle the rising levels of unemployment. So how how large do you think this uh, this BPO uh, uh, activity was? I know there was a conversation uh, uh, which I took part in an academic conversation going on about strategic uh, reshoring. Uh, yeah. that say move stuff closer to Europe so that we don't have the uh, you know the, the dependence on China, which which came out of uh, you know as we know all, all we have, China is still struggling with opening up. Yeah. Um, and everything, everyone was in this big shock for a while. So outsourcing uh, to the Far East became an issue. And this is what they call French shoring. I thought, yeah. I don't like that. Um, yeah. Like another term I heard yesterday called situation ships. Uh, we can talk about it later on. So what the hell is that? Okay. but This is definitely not the place to talk no. about situation ships. <laughs> no. Please. I learned a new word. <laughs> So the the uh, the idea of friend friend uh, shoring uh, that yes we should be somewhere close by strategically reachable places that we are we have people we know type of thing. So you think this to what would you say this is a how large a phenomena was this? Do you know? Do you have any? Sense I think sense? business process outshoring, particularly within the you know the, the call center um, you know the call center businesses. Distance is literally a matter of time zones yeah. in, in BPO. It's not about it doesn't, it's not about proximity to the market. It doesn't need to be proximal. You're not sending or posting goods. It's just people who need to be at the end of a server or a yeah. telephone. And I think that's why BPO has been so successful for Africa because of the time zone advantages, because of you know the the language, um, the lang you know, the language strengths, and uh, uh, so it hasn't um, succumbed to near shoring or friend shoring. Um, that I think it has grown um, during you know during the pandemic, and I think as we see these some of these technology companies, you know, we've seen Twitter close its kind of Africa operations, etc. I think we will see that being balanced by an increase in, in business process outsourcing, not least because of some of the challenges that are happening in, in certainly Europe and some of the Western countries around even just the cost of maintaining staff and maintaining offices, um, particularly due to the, just the cost of keeping the lights on. It makes more sense for them to be able to, to outsource uh, those activities and uh, the increase in remote working, for example, um, being part of that advantage. So maybe not even having to, um, not even to have bricks and bricks and mortar premises, but still benefiting from the advantages of uh, lower labour costs. Hmm. So, but I think uh, the net effect is still negative. The, hmm. There might have been some uh, some reshoring of activity. Yeah. And I think this also comes under the head of supply chain shocks, uh, you know, with uh, with the pandemic, and then post pandemic we have uh, associated shocks. Uh, some say Ukraine matters a lot, and uh, that, that's uh, you know obviously I'm going to turn to Ramesh and ask about the agricultural end of things. Uh, you know, as you say, you, you mentioned there that you had you had a great year, um, and uh, so I, I'm kind of curious uh, to know. Um, um yeah going back through the pandemic how 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 was it uh, for you guys okay sorry so um during the pandemic i think businesses in our sector agri food food processing etc those that had facilities that could convert local produce into food locally 
were the ones that thrived the most. Mm -hmm. And I've done a study across 20 countries in Africa to figure that the most profitable year in the sector came for those companies. Okay. So we were really import substitutes. Mm -hmm. We got the full value for um, devalued currencies and increased prices. I know that sounds very mercenary when I say that, but that's the reality. Importantly, imports became non-available because of supply chain breakdowns or became too expensive. And we got the reflected glory in terms of the price as local producers. Okay. So the real focus was on countries where agriculture and local production was being supported, hiked by policymakers. And therefore, people like us thrived. So that's mm -hmm. the long and short. The important part is that supply chain breakdowns have now reduced, shipping prices have come down, but international prices are still flat and currencies have devalued significantly since the beginning of COVID. Okay. Therefore, local prices for imported food still is very high. And I spoke earlier about the fact that economies have been sucked out of their capacity. So consumer capacity to buy, frankly, is seriously damaged. So imported food, even at the same price as it was two years back, but paying higher local currency prices on account of the devaluation <laughs> is becoming an impossible situation. We are able to substitute for that because we are producing locally and hence we continue to have a good year. The, so, I mean, obviously the, the place that I am going to head towards is the Ukrainian situation and grain. And a lot of people say a lot of inflation has to do with the, the rising cost of foodstuff because of Ukraine. Uh, and and uh, again, let, let Ravish, you, you know this industry best. Um, what's your take on that? Uh, okay, first, you, you realize that this whole uh, industry runs on sentiment. And the moment Ukraine and Ukrainian ports began to get under threat, uh, the bookmakers talked it up, talked it up, talked it up because they had long books and they profited significantly by talking it up. The second thing is that shipments did happen in the middle. They were stopped. They were happening. They were stuttering. Therefore, contracts were at risk. A lot of large companies in Ukraine, like Cargill, like Olam, shut their facilities down due to the risk to their personnel. Okay. So the truth is that significant amount of shipments out of those countries were stopped. That is correct. But the African continent has not been so much impacted by that because they have significant uh, sourcing already set up in North America and France and other European countries for bringing in uh, grain, particularly wheat. Okay, that's number one. Number two is that the real impact of uh, the Ukrainian war is on fertilizer for application. And that is where I think 23 will be impacted. Because fertilizer and other agrochemicals could not be taken out to countries that grow food, like you know East Asia, uh, parts of Europe, uh, those crops will suffer on account of the application being short. We therefore should worry about whether there'll be adequate grain available for import into uh, Africa and other parts of the world that import food because those crops may not be as good. The flat sentiment of prices right now is not reflecting that yet. I do believe come March, April, we will start seeing the signs of the poor application resulting in lower crops, resulting also in securitization by these growing countries about their own food security. Therefore, availability of crop for trade will be limited during 23 and therefore we will see a bullish trend is my view. Okay. okay. Elena, you want to jump in here? Yes, actually, I'd like to ask Ramesh um, what you think about, I think the World Economic Forum published a report uh, just a couple of weeks ago talking about the four sectors that it expects to see the biggest growth and opportunities in for Africa for 2023 and agriculture and agri-processing was one of those. I think the others, uh, automotive, pharma, and transport and logistics. Um, so a very positive outlook, you know, for, for growth there. So what do you what do you what do you make of that? So uh, it's encouraging for a lot of us to read about that. The fact is this: that there are phases that Africa has been through over the last thirty years. Being an export dollar-oriented business was, you know, the beginning of this phase. Mm. That then became value add. Now it's value add for local consumption because food security suddenly become a huge thing. Everybody's talking about it for many, many years. What is the problem took us five, eight years to figure out? What to do about the problem took us about 10, 15 years of discussion. Specifically, what will you do to solve the problem is only in discussion now. I do believe that this is the only sector really to focus on in, in, in my sector. 
agro processing, food processing, uh, convenience foods is really the way ahead. Okay, so whoever wants to commit to that is likely to have a good business going forward. But there are a few challenges. One, capital is not cheap. Number two, power is not cheap. Number three, you're going to compete against the significant manufacturers from where imports already come through, China, Asia, Argentina, India, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be very tough to beat those guys unless you have significant policy support to help these units in the first place. Okay. Having said, and the third the big important thing is skill. We don't have enough skilled people to run these places. Okay, you're okay. Going ahead, so, getting ahead of, of, of the sorry. story, Ramesh. Mm. We're, we're, we'll have to go home early if you do this. Uh, <laughs> okay, now you're touching on a number of things. Let's let's go this step by step here. Uh, first of all, uh, you you touched on on uh, the issue of infrastructure, electricity, uh, water, gas, prices of fuel. I mean, one of the things that I know. Um, in Nigeria, that uh, you know, we are all um, we are all waiting to happen and dreading is the removal of the petroleum <laughs> subsidy, uh, which uh, all three parties have promised they will remove. And it, frankly, the World Bank has made it very clear that uh, that this is a precondition for any bailout which Nigeria will need in uh, in six months' time. Um, so these are obviously adding, I know in Nigeria, this, these add a huge cost. I think one third of the cost of any business now, or is, is half, I would say, goes of the average business goes in, in, in covering these basic costs of, of fuel, electricity, uh, water, these type of things. Um, and how bad is this across the continent? I know what it is like. And I hear about South Africa every day nowadays with ESCOM and so forth. Uh, Elena, you're you're in touch with that uh, that the stuff going on in South Africa and the other places. Yes, uh, the outlook for for South Africa on on this is is not good. There is still no clear path, um, certainly within the short term, out of its current energy crisis. There still appears to be a a real disconnect between those who who uh, you know who support the just transition to renewables and are you know supporting that and driving that and those who look to to Europe and other places and see the increase in coal production and you know new coal power stations coming online and saying well if they're doing that you know why can't we continue um mm -hmm continue with this kind of reliance on, on something that they actually have. Um, so in, until there is some sort of consensus, they're still going to, to be stumbling along in the dark. Sorry to, uh, to use a pun there, but, but that's how it feels. And then I think the, the political situation and not having any sort of road plan um, that, that, that the population can take confidence in, um, being told it's you know several years down the line, um, still with ten hours a day power cuts, um, and with an election on the horizon, makes for a really interesting time in South Africa. And we're seeing, and and we'll come on and talk about it a, a little bit more because it goes back to what Ramesh started to drift into about skills. But you know the impact of that we're starting to see now with with more people, um, you know, I guess, taking the opportunity to to find newer horizons with slightly more stable uh, electricity supply. So I, I think I think this this issue uh, has has several facets, and I, I see a comment here. Uh, question here from Saad uh, Laraki. Saad, by the way, was my my um, in my cohort in the PhD program many many moons ago, and he's based in now nowadays based in Morocco. Uh, welcome, Saad. Uh, he's been coming to a number of our sessions, but I think I think it's first time he's actually put a question up on the board. And one of the things that I'm going to paraphrase it is the question of regional effects. Of course, we talk about a continent with more than fifty countries. Uh, I shan't count the number of countries because there's still a question of whether some countries are actually countries. But let's not go there. Um, but uh, is there, in all of these matters, are we 
do we need to differentiate uh, between regions, between parts of uh, thing? I don't know. In North Africa versus Sub-Saharan Africa. Is there a significant difference? What do you think? Let's start with Elena. It's a good question, but I don't think the differences are necessarily regional. Mm. I think you're going to find clusters of um, similarity in each of the regions. Mm. And I think that's what makes a continent of this size quite a challenging one to A, talk about with, with the conviction that we do um, uh, in terms of, of even thinking about what's going to happen in the future and how you how you frame that. Um, but the, the, the regionalization of the discussions, it just doesn't work. Um, you will look within each of, whether it's North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, East or West, however you want to describe it, you will find that there will be pockets in each of them that are, you know, that are, and, and it's 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 interesting that each one of each one of the four, when we do it from kind of northeast, southern, and west, contains a a, a, a power, an economic powerhouse, if you like, that you can kind of, you know, hive off together um, uh, in terms of economic parity or population parity or those issues, but regionalization doesn't work and it really does make it quite difficult to talk about Africa in the way that we do but we we still have we have to do it yeah. there's there's no way around it and I think it but, we just have to show cognizance of that when we are talking about the continent and recognize when we're talking about the continent as a whole or when we are talking about individual countries or clusters of of similar similar countries yeah uh, that's a very nice, succinct and nice answer. Thank you. Um, I see Ramesh nodding his head. Uh, do you want to add anything? Or Yeah, I think it's a bit uh, crazy to try and say that Nigeria and Benin or South Africa and Zimbabwe or Kenya and Malawi can be similar. Impossible. So I completely agree with her that different countries are similar, but then they're in completely different parts. Though I must say that the North Rim countries uh, are quite different. Their influences mm. are different. Their infrastructural capabilities are different. I also think what they do are very different from the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. So, I mean, a Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt can't be clustered and compared with some of the other parts of Africa is my view. Mm -hmm. But I think that when we're talking about, uh, about these broad issues and we're looking at a forecast, one of the things that strikes me, and, and I know this is obviously part of our debate today, uh, is that... Uh, despite all the differences across the the continent, we are there's a, the the effects of the, well, what we're coming into in from 2022 is are similar. The, some of the challenges we're facing are similar across the continent across the continent, which is kind of striking as well, despite the variation in terms of the pandemic, in terms of the the economy, in terms of recession, in terms of the the. Uh, and of course, one of the things that, uh, you know, that uh, I, you mentioned uh, a couple of things here. Uh, and I think uh, uh, also the, you know, what I want to move towards is a little bit towards the, and also uh, the economic structure of countries. Most of the African countries have a similar economic structure, not just because there are similar stages of development without, with the exception of uh, let's say South Africa and a couple of others, but in the same general range. But one of the things, and I, I'm paraphrasing someone's question here, uh, is that um, all across Africa, we have very few large firms. Um, we have a lot of, and this is actually true everywhere. Uh, the country that has the most, had uh, the most striking difference between large and small firms is actually India, with, uh, with uh, only, with such a small, at least it used to be the case, that it was such a small group of very, very, very large firms, and then a huge tail of elite tiny firms, micro-sized firms, dumb, 99%, I think, if I remember rightly. And uh, you could count, and that I and this was about, this was a, a very detailed uh, survey of every single firm. It was a universe study um, about 10 years, 15 years ago, but things have changed in the last 10 or 15 years. And I think Africa, most African countries have a similar structure whereby you have a handful of large companies and a very long tail 
uh, of uh, incredibly small companies and a large number of of uh, family owned businesses and, and subsistence uh, traders i mentioned the 89% of the of the working force being in the informal sector so really living from hand to mouth now but that's one of the things that that strikes me that uh, uh, therefore when you say that the large firms come out of this uh, unharmed and the small and medium enterprises just don't have any slack to survive uh, survive the, the winter this is especially true uh, in africa now um i want to kind of move this conversation a little bit towards some of the things that that i have alarm bells running on and one of them is the debt defaults that are happening and um, and are 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 going to happen we have uh, ghana which we already seen uh, in in play i see ethiopia coming into play right now um i think nigeria will it's if not for the election this will be already be a conversation to be had i think there are other ones further down south tunisia egypt excuse me i'm not immune to uh, bacteria um <laughs> um yeah so there are a lot of these things going on so this is um and one of the things that struck me and i was talking about this just before we started with uh, elena was the uh, or maybe it wasn't elena i i do stack of these things the um what we were talking about was the uh, the debt moving hands the the chinese refused to renegotiate the debt and everybody else is willing the, the paris club is willing to discount the debt the chinese are refusing to come <laughs> come to the table would you like to comment on that uh, let's start with uh, ramesh right so i'm not surprised at the uh, africans suggesting that they don't have the capacity to service those debts i'm not surprised at all um was if the chinese call in uh, i think they basically want to bring the africans on to the negotiating table to start discussing some big discount deals okay they may not discount the debt but they'll probably look for some kind arrangements like they have done 10 12 years back as both of you are aware paris clubs discounts i don't think will work simply because the countries just don't have the capacity i mean you're talking of zambia zimbabwe egypt uh, ghana ghana is i was i was in ghana last week it is bro- almost completely broken down there is zero confidence in the government and and the government is they are stuck with the government for another 2 years so there's no choice out of that so uh, raj my short answer is that paris club discount will not attract any will not will not get any bite and the chinese will want to sit on the table break the african nations down and then force them into some significant asset uh, tie ups and no i would agree with that or there there's a part of me that when we think about china wonders how much the current uh, they keep calling it scramble for africa i hate that terminology but actually the us china situation and the scramble for support on taiwan and the fact that africa holds a lot of the cards here might how might that impact the hand that china plays or how heavy that hand is played because they need to keep the african nations on side just because the weight of the strength of the weight of the the ability for africa to impact that dynamic around taiwan you know there's potentially some leverage potentially it's one of the things that that uh, we're kind of connecting the geopolitics with uh, the debt mm-hmm. defaults Yeah. the potential debt default uh do you see any variation again uh, across uh, <coughs> across the continent <coughs> elena sorry please repeat that sorry excuse me oh gosh 
please get some water. Yes, um, the, what I'm saying is, is there a big, in terms of the politics of the uh, debt default, mm. is there a large variation between uh, regions? Would you say the, uh, the North Africans are in a better place versus uh, the, the, the countries with mining uh, activities? Or I don't mm -hmm. know, what, what, what's, uh, is there any variation across the continent? So who's got the best bargaining chips? Yes or potentially the exploitable resources that, and I think you alluded to it, um, yeah. you, you alluded to it. So the commodity rich countries potentially, potentially have bargaining power, but actually if the strength of the Chinese hand um, comes to play, and the African countries are not as robust in their negotiating. In, and it does feel like that sometimes, the, the ability to capitulate over the fear of um, you know, financial devastation. And we've seen that time and time again. Um, if those countries don't, play hardball at the negotiating table, then anything and everything is up for grabs, particularly, and let's link it back to something you've mentioned earlier when it comes to the supply chain shocks. So the, all of these issues are interconnected now, aren't they? And we're seeing how, how quickly and easily the kind of tectonic plates can shift in one direction or another. And I think it will come down to um, the ability of, of the leaders in these countries to recognize the strength of their hand and to play that hand well. It's going to be an interesting one to watch. I, I, I can't predict how it will play out. I, I think we're at high stakes, high stakes games yeah. going on at multiple levels. So we're coming into 2022 with a lot of elections coming around across the continent and uh, elections. The problem with election, then everyone talks about democracy is a wonderful thing. The downside of, uh, of democracy is that you have to make popular decisions or decisions that are popular, but not necessarily good for you. And uh, you know, I again point to the example of Nigeria and the uh, petroleum uh, issue. Um, this should have been done a long time ago, but um, nobody has the courage to do so, or has had the courage to do so. And uh, I think we've seen the same thing in, in North Africa with the price of wheat. Mm -hmm. Government subsidizes the wheat because, again, elections are coming, and so on and so forth. So we see a kind of nexus <laughs> of political uh, problems faced with debt defaults. Um, and we're looking at burning issues and many, many burning issues happening simultaneously. So where do we, want, how do we want to, how do we think this is going to play out? I'm happy for predictions. This is, I know this is being recorded, but uh, I can't use it to blackmail you later on. Elena, you first. You know, so I think I think this is the era of African countries really playing the cards that they've got and playing them well, right? So if I go back to the point that I was just making about US-China relations, we're already seeing the US's kind of, you know, diplomacy machine springing into action. We're gonna see more visits, there are going to be more initiatives and grant funded, um, uh, grant funded activity by the likes of USAID as part of the, you know, this diplomacy machine to, 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 to counter the strength of, of the Chinese presence on the continent. And we're also seeing a little bit of the EU uh, dynamics there. So EU, largest investor on the continent. There's going to be lots of different external players jockeying for relevance. We're going to see, I think, an increase as well in, in the, this dynamic from the UK. 
um, you know, competing with the EU um, really <laughs> post post Brexit, a little shudder, um, but also that threat of, of, of you know, China. Um, so it will be up to these countries to really exploit all of those things, absolutely make the most of them and make them work for them. We, we've spoken a little bit about, and we'll go into it shortly, the skill situation. And I think we're going to see more opportunities for scholarships, more opportunities potentially in, in employment um, prospects in these markets. It's going to be it's going to be really interesting kind of to sit back and watch this scramble because it's not going to be subtle because there's so much at stake for all of those players. So let's see how these how these leaders, given all the other things that they're going to have to be managing, whether it's you know elections, um, domestic challenges, energy crises, commodity crises, agri crises, you know, climate uh, impacts on food security. They're going to have to be juggling all of these balls, but will they be able to, to really take advantage of the diplomacy the kind of, it's just going to be this gust that's going to kind of swoosh across the continent. Um, and, it, and these opportunities will be there for the taking. So, Raj, go on, go on. To, add, to add to what uh, Elena said, I have one point of difference. Um, my view is that, and, and I've been uh, dreading this, that when you combine election with some large scale, uh, long term decisions that the politicians have to make, they generally tend to combine the two and make really, forgive me, crappy decisions because they want to look good. They want to seem like somebody who's brought the trophy home and they're just not thinking of the future of the country. Okay. So if they have to negotiate a debt and just imagine countries like uh, Brazzaville and uh, Zambia and, and some of these rich countries, uh, the trading chip of their uh, mines or commodities is easy to, you know, let go and, and write out a, write off a, a Chinese debt and, look like victors while nobody in the in the common population understands the long term or the medium term impact of this so my worry is that there'll be lots of compromises that the politicians will make to win the next election uh, or to strike a deal before the election happens so that the benefits are garnered and both are not good for the african country is my view i i think i think i i tend to uh, agree that there is a tendency for politicians to think short term and have short term victories although i have to say with the whole uh, current british government um, they're not demonstrating any a, a much better a, a grasp of uh, of long term uh, actions or strategic actions um, in fact they seem to they seem to be gifted uh, Boris you know, started the trend and it seems to be continuing, but let's not go there. Now, one of the things that, that the two or three things that you guys have brought up, one is the, the uh, I think that if the cards are played right, geopolitics will help, or being astute at playing geopolitics will help because the Americans uh, are popping up everywhere. The Brits are trying to outdo the Europeans and the Chinese are coming in and half-heartedly the, the Indians pretend to be interested. So everybody is in this kind of game trying to say to, uh, but it, uh, it requires a certain amount of finesse to, to pull off the best deal. Uh, unfortunately, I not, I don't, I'm not a great believer that they will do so. Um, and I think one of the, it's, it's a combination of badly trained uh, bureaucrats or simply bureaucrats who feel they've been ignored too long. A uh, uh, number of years ago, I went, I had gone on a mission, you, you, you need to do a mission to uh, Tanzania and I was uh, training bureaucrats how to negotiate contracts. Uh, and we were trying to stimulate a contract negotiation and the uh, people from the Ministry of Power who we were training said we're only here because they were not showing any enthusiasm so I said what's wrong they said well you know we don't make this decision the we can negotiate all we want 
And then there's a phone call between the minister of power and the, and the CEO of the company, and they agree on a price. We have nothing to do with us. The price has been already determined by, by the big people. So we have actually come to attend your course because it's, we get a week off to listen to you. Um, and uh, and I found this in Tanzania, I found this in Uganda, I can mention a few other countries, and, and it was quite depressing because I had flown there thinking I was going to make a difference. And <clears throat> this is often the case that the, the big guys have made this decision uh, uh, in, this, in this regard. So I think the debt default in the political situation don't fill me with a lot of hope. One of the things that is that the average person, and one of the things I also I've learned over the years is the average person is actually quite rational. The person on the street is no fool. They know when things are about to go south. And uh, we see this with the brain drain. Um, and we see the kind of the very large number of uh, Nigerians, for, and, and I noticed the Nigerians obviously popping up in the UK, teachers, doctors, nurses, um, and I think the same thing is across, across I suspect it's across the continent, I may be wrong. Um, and, uh, and I think this is a, this is a phenomena that not just, no, not, but we're talking about Africa, we don't have to go global on this matter. And this is something that, that matters because on the one hand, there are jobs, opportunities that are going to come, hopefully, as Elena says, in terms of BPO, in terms of uh, French shoring, in terms, as you, you know, there are opportunities. There are clearly opportunities. As you said, the growth rates in most African countries is much better than in, in Europe, not unsurprisingly. But once we start losing the best people, and you and you guys know as well as I do, finding good people uh, is a challenge. And someone has actually commented on on the in this uh, in the chat box. Um, <clears throat> um, how do we? How do we respond to the brain drain? I mean, I can't tell someone, no, no, stay where you are because good times are coming. Just hold on tight. Um, and, um, uh, you know, security situation, et cetera. No, I, no, I, I get emails from, from Nigeria along these lines saying, security situation, look, I can't go anywhere outside my, my town anymore. I need a job. I need something anywhere, anything at all. And you can feel, feel for them because this is not a good situation to be in. So brain drain, uh, what do we do? 2022 may be a good year, but then there are no people on the ground. And that's the most basic unit of, of a recovery, are the people. We don't just want to have you know, a continent of farmers and everybody else, farmers or, or businessmen, and they should, they should be people in the middle to run the businesses. Uh, and uh, well, Ramesh, you're, you're, on, uh, you're always hunting for people, as far as I know. Um, what uh, what's your what's the story? What do you, how do you read it on the ground? Sorry, so Raj, I'll start by saying that when I drive to work every morning here, I see two big queues: one for fuel and the other outside ATM machines for cash. Okay, and both are about sixty bodies to eighty bodies long. One is car bodies and one is human bodies. Yeah. All right. Frankly, it's not an inspiring sight for a young, talented uh, professional to want to stay with, number one. Number two, I think I said this to you when we last met, that uh, we own uh, Nigeria's second oldest bank called Union Bank. And the MD of the bank told me that during the months of September, October, November, December, he lost 467 young people who migrated, who left the bank. These are now technically competent guys, accountants, risk managers, uh, HR personnel, and so on, who left. So the truth is, we are not giving them conditions for them to want to stay, mm. right? Number one. Number two, my bigger challenge is that basic education itself has to be uptuned for these guys to eventually turn out as good quality talent. Okay, that's number two. Number three, technical training institutions are few and far between, if at all. Like a, a, a very close Nigerian friend once told me that when you see the flooring of most homes in, in Nigeria, You'll see the center is okay. But when they go to the corner, they don't know how to finish the corner because that mason has not been taught in a technical institution as to how that is done. Now he's doing it with experience. Okay. So we have a couple of challenges that are put together leading to this uh, human capital shortage, which is mm -hmm. why even for uh, an electrician, you're looking for an expatriate. So, so we are talking of some deep-rooted reasons uh, that are leading up to this problem. 
the the migration is is a more recent problem is my view hmm. so i think uh, do you think we're coming to a head with this problem uh, i mean uh, so i mean on the one hand there are opportunities that are, that, that that we need we need uh, for a recovery there are sit there if there is uh, everyone's coming to africa look to start things to keep things going so that who's how do we stop this what, what this is a chicken and egg story but the kind of in a in a very strange way how do we stop this because there is no confidence uh, at least uh, i'm not seeing a huge amount of confidence uh, in from anyone uh, yes you see the good news newspapers saying everything's going to be fine soon uh, because uh, yeah africa will recover and etc uh, etc et growth rates are great but uh, we don't have the people yeah but uh, raj growth rates i mean you spoke earlier about the fact that growth rates in africa are better than eu but on what base so the size and scale of our industry is so small <laughs> you know that even if we grow 10% 20% we're not talking too much Mm-hmm. i think the solution for human capital is a, is a long drawn one we are we are in this race for next 20 30 40 years before we can resolve it the capacity and the appetite for businessmen like men like me to invest in africa remain strong on the basis that either i find solutions locally or i'll find solutions internationally it's on that basis and the view of the opportunity is that it's a it's a it's a global view that mm-hmm. it's a it's it's a it's a business that i can grow it's a business that i can uh, fend for the long term because the country the continent will give me opportunities as we go along mm-hmm. while for the young uh, unemployed there is no near uh, solutions available it's not like jobs are waiting to be taken yeah yes so okay so that's the average man's angle uh, and uh, so that will lead to more exodus you're expecting a bigger exodus of people is what you're saying yes uh elena you want to jump in are you more optimistic so i agree there will be an exodus and there is a mix isn't there of push factors so the things at home that are pushing you out and pull factors in other economies that are attracting you right and other countries that are really aggressive about recruiting you know scarce skills or really in demand skills into their economies and i think we have to accept that and accept that that's normal it's not unusual these migratory cycles these push pull factors are not unusual and therefore it's up to governments to think about how they respond to it because they're not going to be able to stem the tide because right. once people decide that they want to go they've yeah. made that decision and they will pursue those opportunities and so they should mm. and you know there's you know being patriotic is wonderful but actually leaving your country and pursuing opportunities somewhere else are a personal growth and so as much as we want to you know stay and build our countries and and contribute to the economies people also want to contribute to their own life experiences their own well-being and so we have to acknowledge that that's just part of the normal ordinary human experience and you know it should be encouraged the response then lies for governments to actually have far better engagement with business so that they understand the skills that are required so that they can influence you know their education pipeline so that they're making sure that there are these skills available people are being developed for you know the economy the needs of the economy but also might have to take some really tough decisions about opening up their own countries to people coming in to fill some of those gaps and we know that's a really difficult thing and you see it on the continent particularly where there's a, a you know high un- high local unemployment but also high numbers of people from neighboring countries and 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 the the tussles that that causes but i think it's time to start having those conversations because what you don't want are the potential employers 
particularly in sectors where we're saying there's going to be growth, like agri and agro-processing, to then take those businesses off the continent to, to the sources of labour that are elsewhere, but start thinking about the different ways in which you know, these issues can be addressed at home. And some of that might be short term, you know, influxes of um, of labour from elsewhere in order to meet those demands, which then, and this is me being incredibly optimistic, you know, this is yeah. a very cool by our vision, but, you know, contributing then to the, the increase in the economy, and then hopefully people say seeing those those fruits um, back home and wanting to come back and be part of that. But I don't think people should be discouraged from pursuing those opportunities elsewhere. Well, you know, this is a, it. The idea of uh, intra-African immigration is what you're suggesting. Absolutely. Uh, and this is uh, one of the bench, one of the founding pillars of the um, African continental free trade area uh, and they've, we've tried a little bit of this I think uh, within East Africa there is now in principle uh, some amount of free movement of people uh, ECOWAS tried this but Nigeria always blocks it uh, and it's been blocking it systematically for uh, well as long as I can remember um, and South, South Africa has always struggled with this problem in the in the so there is, there are, uh, you know, there are uh, issues of, uh, I don't know, whether you want to call it tribalism, tribalism or simply jealousy, you know, you're taking our jobs, you know, which of course is never a, a, a good outcome. I, there, are, there have been wars in Africa based on these type of things, and I shan't mention any names here. So... In principle, I would say this is a good idea. Now, one of the one of the there's a comment. Uh, I think. Uh, let me see. I see this in the Q and A. Uh, Arnold Shu. I uh, hope I'm pronouncing that right. Right says, how do you see the role of Af the African diaspora in Europe and North America to stimulate entrepreneurship investment in Africa? Can we do we see any? Do we see the the transcontinental? Uh, uh, is that a solution? Uh, can we, are we going to get the people from the diaspora, from Nigerians and I can, or Ghanaians or Zambians working in Europe, or coming home to address this issue? I don't, I don't know. Maybe this is a very, it's a very general statement. So, but let me let me throw this to you, Ramesh. Let's give this a few minutes. Right. So. I have worked in organizations where we have tried very hard to attract the diaspora to come back so that we can start the process of nationalization in the large company. Okay. And uh, we went to fairs, we went to universities where Africans, uh, but the, the, the one is that even if you pay them international prices for them to come back to their home country, uh, the desire is very low. And I'll be very honest, the desire is very low. Recently, I managed to hire a few uh, members of the diaspora, uh, but then they are, 50, 55, want to bring their children back, want to bring their, come back to their roots and settle down uh, in the African country. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in general, young diaspora coming back to the con continent, uh, I have not had any favorable results to report. Nothing meaningful. That is, you know, so that's one thing. The other thing is that I do believe that the Pan-African labor movement treats an African from another country as much of a foreigner as from anywhere else in the world. So for example, Raj just envisage an Ethiopian trying to come and work in Nigeria mm. or an Ivorian trying to go and work in Kenya. Mm. They are very, very different people and their methods of working and what they are used to are completely different from each other. Mm. I mean, no Ethiopian will even envisage wanting to come and work in Nigeria. You just try that. Even in a multinational telling, I'm transferring you to Nigeria, impossible. He'll just refuse the job. So I think this myth of, uh, you know, Africa as one major canvas and just move people, it, it will not work. Also, okay. then there is effectiveness. How can you expect an Ivorian to be effective in Kenya? Hmm. So does that give you an answer? Yes, I think, Elena, jump in on this. Oh, well, 
I'm I'm not enti- I'm not sure I uh, agree with you entirely, but I guess it depends on the opportunities because there are lots of diasporans or as we might call them people of African descent who are now living, working, investing in the continent. Um, and the investing bit is important. So there are a lot of them who are coming over and they're setting up their own businesses, setting up their own entities, you know, um, have, having had enough of life in the US or the UK or in Germany um, and wanting that connection back to self and the continent and sometimes being quite agnostic about where, you know? And I think there is more that can be done to capitalize on, on that. Um, I'm not entirely sure how that would help you, for example, Ramesh, in your business, um, but uh, I, I definitely think it's untapped in terms of opportunity, um, untapped in terms of, I think you mentioned, you, you, you focused a little bit on young people coming back, but actually older ones too. You know, there is a lot of value in older people who are maybe ready for just something ever so slightly different now, a different pace, a different environment. They want to get heat in their bones to deal with their arthritis. I will be one of those soon enough. I, I don't think I can do too many more winters in, in, in the Northern Hemisphere, who are also a, a, a useful resource that should be tapped into that pre-retirement, you know, that semi-retirement kind of community within the diaspora. I think we always focus on young people because the continent is, you know, home to lots of young people. But if we're trying to attract people back in, I think there are more can be done. And I think it would surprise people the appetite that there is out there for people who want to, to live and work on the continent, despite all of the challenges. People always say that, well, why do they want to, you know, we've got power cuts, we've got this, we've got corruption, we've got, you know, these are all things that we're dealing with in our own way. <laughs> you know, I, up here I in the I cold part of the world, you know, so it's not too different. We're well versed in Ramesh, it. Ramesh comes from a different perspective, so this is interesting, because yep. as, as he knows, I, I keep you know, talking about going back to Nigeria, and, uh, and and I go for a few weeks, and then I come back again. Um, and, you know, his, his wife has the same problem, I think. She, she uh refuses to leave the continent, uh, but yet she sort of has this love-hate relationship with Nigeria now. Um, and Elena, you know, as, as one of the diaspora, um, so described. Uh, so I think there is something to be said for there is a space for the diaspora, but I don't think it's large enough uh, for to fix the problem. It's, not, it's by no means ad- addresses the problem. It may address... So my experience is that when people come from the diaspora, uh, especially from North America, uh, they tend to come with rose, not rose-tinted goggles, but everything is rosy. They, I don't know what they've been smoking before they come, but they just think they'll come in and everybody will hug them at the airport and and everything will be fine from there on out. And they come in and they're always shocked at how different, you know, they, they, you know we look alike, but this is not working for us. And then after six months, they're on the plane back. Um, and uh, but I think this is certainly uh, something that has should be explored further. I don't. I personally am not sure about the Africa Continental Free Trade Area is going to make that much of a, a difference. Uh, and yes, I think certainly. And I see a lot of comments, by the way. In the uh, by the way, um, both both Elena and Ramesh do have a look at the comments if you want to address something. Uh, feel free to to do so. Um, I mean. To what extent is this really an education problem? We have a comment here about uh, 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 about uh, about education. Isn't I mean, in some ways, we've got um, we have the wrong quality of education, but at other places, we don't have. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure uh, what's wrong with. I mean, it's it's sometimes it's basic skills uh, where we are, are missing. 
Um, so I'm not sure, but I don't want to. This will be, it's a whole debate, and maybe I should make this a, a conversation on a country level yes. basis because each country has a different set of problems. Uh, I can only speak about uh, one uh, country, um, and I'm not an expert in this in the educational area. Ramesh's uh, children have studied in South Africa, so he might be able to speak on that. But I, I'm not sure this is the solution. Do you uh, want to say something on this before we move on? Yes. So Raj, uh, I think the basic, in my experience of going to multiple universities across Africa, trying to look for young talent, especially in agriculture, farming, agro-processing, technical, the one big challenge is that the quality of teaching is inadequate. We'll come to curriculum, we'll come to infrastructure, we'll come to laboratories, all of that much later. The people committed to teaching are inadequate. The numbers are not enough, the quality is inadequate. So take Makrere in Uganda, for example, yeah. one of the premier agricultural universities uh, of the past. If you compare it from where I have experienced it 20 years back to today, uh, the, 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 the standards are incomparable. So mm -hmm. I'm specifically taking a name. Okay. So like that, there has been significant deterioration in the quality of uh, education being offered to the children. Therefore, now to expect them to step up and become world class is really expecting too much. Yeah, no, I think that there, as I said, education is such a such a huge topic. We could be here for hours on end. Um, I, I think that uh, let 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 one of the, I mean, these problems we are describing are known to everyone. Uh, we're not really, you know, kind of uh, revealing anything that uh, that hasn't been the problem. And I think. So I know I would don't I I normally I would say what should governments do and I but I realize the problem here is is uh, created by the government in, in some extent they've been fairly pathetic in handling these issues the ineptness uh, of the state is sort of almost a singular quality that every country uh, shares uh, some less than others and it's all relative you know. I, I think some countries would would wouldn't mind would think they may think the Nigerian government to be incredibly efficient. Um, I don't know who, but there may well be a country where they feel they would like to swap. Uh, but um, uh, maybe the question is what what so what if you had um, you know uh, the opportunity to to what can be done because we don't want to have a miserable 2023 or we want to turn things around. And I feel that I'm always talking about how we can turn things around, but let me extend my optimism for one more day. Now, what can we do? Um, uh, or what should they have? Or what could? They, what should they have done? Maybe that's even a better question. Apart from the obvious ones of of having good electricity, good water, good schools, uh, which uh, yeah, these are kind of generic things, uh, but. Um, uh, yeah, I think that perhaps you can, uh, maybe we can play with this. One of the things that you brought up was the issue of foreign exchange. And to me, I, I know I'm kind of trained as an economist. I always think about this as a, as a fundamental common sense thing that everyone should understand that if you buy, if you spend more than you earn, you owe somebody money. And this is uh, such a simple uh, basic uh, uh, analogy. And and at some point in time, they will stop giving the money. This doesn't matter whether you're individual, unless you have a rich father. This is the summary of it. The short, uh, I, you, know, you know, if you have good fortune of being born rich, this is not your problem. But essentially, you should never spend more than you make. Uh, this is common sense that everybody learns at, you know, when they're, when they're in school. Uh, you don't have to take a lecture a course on economics to learn this basic principle. So, and this is where we we come to the issue of foreign exchange, because as you say, there are plenty of agriculture going on. Africa is, you know, in terms of agriculture, that's you're in the continent that matters. If you're going to be in agricultural value chains, everything comes out there. But at the same time, we import everything else. Uh, or, uh, you know, so this is, uh, com to me, it's common sense, of course, is why are we importing everything else? Um, and one of the principles of, of, of changing the exchange rate, of course, is to make it harder to import because you don't have the money, you can't import. So therefore, you have to find a substitute. And this is a kind of the most common sense thing. But unfortunately, we're not seeing that happening. So 
Do you want to say something about this? Let's, let Elena uh, go. <laughs> no, I think I think you're right. Um, I mean, there are opportunities, um, and they have been for a long time. And conversations and discussions about domestic um, domestic production, domestic supply, domestic value addition, rather than constantly you know, producing things and sending them elsewhere and then buying them back. Um, but like many of the things that we've spoken about this evening, where we know the answers, and people know what the answers are and potentially what the solutions are, but never quite get around to capitalizing on them. And so I, I don't think that would change. I would like to see a difference this time around. And there's part of me that would hope that the, you know, the supply chain shocks that came with the pandemic, for example, would create a little bit of a change in, in the focus on domestic production. Mm. I would love to think that that's a possibility, but I'm not entirely, I'm, I'm not sure that, that we're going to see that. Um, Ramesh. Mm. Sorry, remind me. Yes. What is, so what is the no. So agriculture. It's 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 actually this is your point. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everybody is importing everything. Uh, um, you you buy up all the grain and the soy soybeans and the uh, the cashew. So, yeah. <laughs> the the bad news, Raj, is that. While this is the continent where agriculture should happen, this continent imports $45 billion worth of food. And that bill has gone up in, in front of me from $30 billion to $45. My, my, my estimate is that in the next 10 years, we'll be importing $100 plus million, billion of food. Okay, Simply because agriculture is not developing at the rate at which it should feed the mouths. And the holy grail of agriculture is yield. And that is what defines the success stories of agriculture. So Vietnam, Thailand are all big winners because their yield numbers are completely different. Mm. So it's not about agriculture. It's about policymakers. Are they allowing for the right kind of seed to enter the continent, be planted and provide higher yield? Number one. Number two, is agriculture, is uh, uh, fertilizer and chemicals being suitably subsidized for farmers to afford it so that they can apply and get higher yield? There is no climate smart uh, applications on the continent that are supporting these small scale farmers. Most of the small scale farmers, not just and not just in Africa, across the world, are destined to be poor because there are no support systems that take care of them. And then we expect that because they have 60% of the land in the world to plant on, these African farmers will magically find the solution to feed the world. Won't happen. So those numbers that we look at, 60% agricultural crop, enough water, fantastic sunlight, all that is great. Putting it together is where the money is. And that we are unable to do. And unless we do that, nor can we save our forex, nor can we earn our forex. Does that answer your question? That does answer the question. Yeah, I, it is. It is always uh, uh, a, a question uh, wherever, whenever one goes. Um, and as you say, it looks nice. There's there's lots of land. There's fairly good. The the, the quality of the land is excellent. Uh, the yes, and uh, but there's nothing to show for it in terms of local value added and. Uh, the focus then tends people. There's a tendency, I think, from governments to focus on the the fancy projects, not the uh, uh, you know the uh, electric battery discussion, the lithium conversation. Now that lithium cannot be exported because we must make our own batteries. And I'm here. I'm wandering into Elena's uh, space. Uh, yes. So over to you. <laughs> Yes, yes, domestic production, um, particularly within the, the critical mineral space. Look, there is such an opportunity, but it requires level heads and clear heads to think it through. We're seeing demand, and I, you mentioned lithium, so, you know, this race for, for battery technology. And we're seeing, you know, with the the... The, the collapse of British vaults, for example, a couple of weeks ago, creating ripples actually across the world as people know that there's a 
you know, the UK has a huge ambition around net zero and now its attempt to create its own kind of, you know, battery supply chain kind of falling away creates opportunities for others. And it's a conversation that I've been having with some people on the continent about how they might be able to capitalize on that by looking at domestic production on the continent and looking at how you build out a, a battery supply chain, you know, keeping it all. And, you know, we know lithium and, and other critical minerals are very volatile, so they require um, a good chunk of that supply chain to be near the source. And there's a great opportunity then to create in some markets, you know, a, a market for batteries that can then be exported to service these demands, which means you meet local demand, you're creating a local industry. And we've heard that auto is one of the four growth sectors that we're expecting to see on the continent. So why not, you know, green auto, um, as, as you might call it. So I would hope to see some, some, some clear heads having very sensible discussions now around how the continent approaches its mineral wealth, you know, and taking some, some leaves out of the book of Botswana, who've always been great at kind of managing their mineral wealth and saying, well, what can we do? Again, I've been saying from the start of this, from the start of this webinar, it's all about capitalizing on these opportunities at home domestically because of all these other kind of geopolitical things that are happening elsewhere. Do I see it happening? I don't know, because we just, you know, we've got there, there is no, <laughs> we, you know, there's nothing that we can point to and say, aha, look, actually, you know, they're starting to get it. They're starting to understand this opportunity and grasping it. Yeah, and no, I, I think that one of the kind of we're going back to the beginning where we're talking about small and medium enterprises versus large enterprises the battery technology and battery this is not a small this is not an sme thing this is not someone in the backyard making batteries this will be we're talking serious amounts of cash and then we are back into the can this can anyone any individual do this uh it will be the very large businesses and then, uh, you know, it's not a small, it's not an SME thing. It's going to be, and it'll, and it, it'll probably be a, a state-owned enterprise, which of course is, a, you know, a hole in the ground to throw money into uh, across most of Africa. Um, so I'm not sure. So what, I think, let, let's try and end this, this where we're coming to the end of today. What we'll end on this on SMEs. What are the, what should, uh, this is uh, Aaron uh, in the audience has asked this earlier on, uh, everything going wrong, what should SMEs can't focus on? Uh, what can they leverage going forward? Let's see if we can say something uh, positive and constructive in, in closing. Uh, I think, yeah, go on, <laughs> Ramesh. Mr. Yeah. Positive. So, uh, um, uh, Raj, I have found a very interesting formula through which SMEs have survived alongside large companies. Okay. And I think if large companies start looking at it a bit more constructively, they can make it work. I'll give you an example. Uh, Olam ran a, the world's largest cashew processing plant in Tanzania in a place called Matwara. 500 kilometers around Matwara, there is no industry of any kind. But that 7,000 worker family was very soon split into five uh, units which were run by Tanzanian SMEs. Mm. And each of them did a specialized part of the very large process that 7,000 workers did. Okay. And then Olam had a central unit, which used to receive all their finished products and do the necessary finishing off so that it could eventually make an export product. I'm just giving you a broad example of what is possible. Yeah. What it basically did was broke up a large factory into five separate SMEs. Each of them employed between four to 500 workers. Mm. This model worked successfully for quite some time. Similarly, a lot of large industries can be broken up and less skilled, less specialized jobs can be handed over to SMEs. They don't need to be 500 workers. They can be 40 workers. They can be 20 workers. Something to break up large businesses and allow for these SMEs to survive alongside. It's like mm -hmm. those little fish that swim with the sharks. That's mm -hmm. what we need. Little fish that swim with the sharks. Okay. 
as an image uh, that uh, I once in a once upon a time I used to try scuba diving and um, I did that for a few years and I I have to say I don't trust the sharks because they they you know, very good that's another story uh, and enough. I like the little fish that swim with the sharks analogy because, you know, if I think about my own field and my own, the own air, the area in which I work, we're seeing a lot of opportunities being taken away from the sharks and being given to the little fish. And, and we're seeing that happening, you know, around the world. So I spoke earlier about being able to capitalize on the opportunities that are going to come from this scramble for Africa. Right. And a lot of those are going to be beneficial to the SMEs when you're looking at things like the grant opportunities that are going to come from whether it's USAID and, and some of those entities. They are coming. They're happening. The, the UK government's got loads of programs that are looking for local SMEs who have solutions to local problems, whether it's around climate resilience, transportation, how to how 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 cities can can make the most out of the data that it collects in order to create um, to manage service delivery. All of these big issues are being tackled at the small business level. And so I would say to any SMEs, particularly any SMEs tuning in to this webinar, to make sure that they're keeping their eyes and ears open for these opportunities because I believe the continent is going to be awash with those. And a lot of those opportunities are about helping those SMEs to grow and scale their businesses and the solutions that they are providing. So I'd say SMEs, your time is now. It's a very positive uh, uh, end note. Um, Raj, one comment before you close. Yes. Uh, the big advantage of being the fish around the, uh, the small fish around the shark is that the shark is looking to somehow build an identity that is national. Okay. And having built SMEs on which the business is dependent gives it a good feeling, especially when you go for dialogue with policymakers. Mm -hmm. You're actually helping the local economy, local uh, employability, more importantly, local upskilling and creating SMEs that are going to be here in the long term. It's, it's a good story for these MNCs or the large businesses to sell. And I therefore believe that it is a, it's a it's a uh, workable formula. I, I think I like the idea, and I, hopefully we have people in this room, uh, our virtual room, who will take these ideas forward. I mean, really, one of the, and I said it's a conversation. No, no, the our strap line uh, byline is, uh, it's a continent wide conversation. So I'm really. Uh, um, you know, there is a there. You know, there's a couple of people here who as I don't know if you've been seeing this. This very uh, some gentleman has, or I, I'm not sure who it is, but uh, Chisakula has listed ten top ten takeaway points. Shall, shall we share this? Uh, does does he mind if we share this to the entire room? Because it's only to the uh, to the uh, to the panelists. If you don't mind, we'll share this with uh, with the rest of the. Kevin, I could you just cut and paste that or while I I mean they're, they're, let me read this out politicians short sight so the top 10 takeaways politicians sought short sightedness two sovereign debt and irresponsible borrowing three education system four local manufacturing slash domestic production five natural resource exploitation and curse of the African continent well I don't know what is specifically to Africa uh, resource exploitation is a common problem everywhere. Uh, this six disillusioned youth, se uh, seven lack of skilled human capital, eight immigration and mass, nine climate smart agricultural practice, ten good seeds, non GMO. I think this is a it's a very nice uh, summary of all the points. I, I think one thing I should say that I I'm not of the opinion that uh, that. Uh, um, uh, these things are, are all Africa specific. I really find this uh, that over the years I've been to all the continents, I think, except Antarctica, and I have a feeling even there the same problems exist, uh, except that there are a lot of penguins. There's you know small technical details like that, but otherwise it's the same. 
Um, the, in Latin America, the conversation is exactly the same. The, the supply, oversupply of uh, of uh, natural resources and the failure to exploit this in any useful uh, way. Um, and uh, so I think, I think uh, uh, incompetent governments also are not specific to, uh, to Africa. There are you know, plenty of them. Uh, sadly, um, yeah, that's another uh, conversation for another time. Um, I think that uh, that uh, I want to say in, in closing, these are all again, these are all starting points. So we are we are opening up all of these Pandora boxes, and you know, the Pandora had more than one box. Who knew? Um, and now we are going to, and I want you to encourage the audience to suggest things. If you think this is an interesting topic and you want to suggest it as a future webinar, I'm very open to uh, welcoming. Uh, 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 our audience uh, inspired suggestions for future topics uh, we can we don't necessarily have to focus always across Africa because it is as we are you know it's very clear there are too many variations there's too, there's too much heterogeneity so it'll be interesting to see specific topics within specific countries or regions and I think I'm going to talk to Saad about maybe something or, along that, those lines and bring in the North African perspective which is somewhat uh, different but anyway, in, I know it's time getting to time for dinner for many people in, in the continent. And uh, I think it's now all remains for me today is to thank our speakers. Uh, uh, Ramesh, as always, it's been a pleasure. I've really enjoyed uh, your insight. It's, you know, it's, it's refreshing to have an honest businessman. Uh, this is almost a war <laughs> on there. Uh, it's, like, it's like honest politicians, the same thing, you know. Uh, Elena. It was a pleasure uh, to have you, and uh, I owe you uh, a, a nice dinner and a book uh, uh, at your earliest uh, convenience. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, thank audience. You thank you all. And thank you for the great questions, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, and see you next uh, next month, uh, same place, uh, uh, Thursday, first Thursday of next month. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. Stay on uh, Elena for a minute too.